Hey, Valley family, this is week number three in our series that we're calling Boundaries. We're, we're looking at really how to really relate in a Christian, a godly way, uh, maybe to difficult people that are in our lives, uh, you know, kind of the, the full spectrum. Week number one, Pastor Stephen did a fantastic job talking about controlling people. How do we relate to them in, in a Christ-like way? Last week, we talked about uh, how to relate to critical people. Next week is going to be the finale of our series and we're going to be talking about uh, hypocritical people. I know that's none of us up in here. It's all those out there, right? Uh, but how to relate to hypocritical people. And uh, so I hope you'll make plans to join us for that. Uh, today, though, I want to talk about how to relate to needy people. How to relate to needy people. And no, no relationship or correlation at all. But before we jump in, I want to say hey to our Poughkeepsie campus. Not that you're needy, but we love you guys in our online campus. Hundreds and hundreds of people, you know, in Poughkeepsie every week and online as well. I think if you put those two numbers together, probably 500 plus uh, between those two every single solitary week. And uh, we really do love you. And we love the whole idea. One church, multiple locations. No question about that. If you have your Valley app, I want to invite you to go ahead open up. And you'll be able to store these notes on your app, fill in the blanks, and be able to look back on it. Because uh, I, I think all of us do, we relate to, we have needy people in our lives. Uh, and, and the big question is, how do we care for and love those needy people uh, that maybe are hurting, uh, maybe need some extra attention uh, in, in our lives, uh, that at the same time kind of drain us if we don't have real wisdom in how to relate to them. And I think Really, let's be honest, you're in church, you ought to be honest, uh, every family has that one needy person, overly needy person in it, uh, every team, every office, every group. In fact, let me just ask you right now, uh, raise your hand if you know, if there's someone, you know, you can relate to that, needy people, every family, every team, every office, go ahead, raise your hand. Yeah, now look around, those that don't have their hands up, yeah, you know who they are. Anyway, uh, you know, don't take that person or anything, just, just trying to get your attention there. We all have them in, in our life, no question about them. And, uh, and like when you see them, you know this is not going to be a short conversation. Every time you know, they kind of walk by like, oh, here goes 25 minutes, uh, they tend to dominate uh, conversation with negative stories. There's always a drama. They're, they're always in crisis. Every little thing, just literally crisis to crisis or what they think is crisis, but in reality it's not a, at all a, a crisis. Uh, and it seems like the more that you do for them, it, it's never enough. Uh, you give and, and they just need more uh, maybe it's that relative of yours that, that's all alone and wants everyone to feel sorry for him all the time. Uh, or, or that guy in your small group that, that just seems to have no friends. Or that buddy that always seems to need some extra cash because he just can't make ends meet. Needy, needy. And you do for him and it's never enough. And uh, you, you give and they always really need more. And, and the thing is... Uh, you know, maybe it's even a, a coworker uh, that, that's always fishing for compliments, that's really just in, in a mess, and uh, you know has a permanent ticket on the struggle bus. Uh, you know, it's complicated because we we want to do, we want to help people, uh, and at the same time, it just kind of drains the life completely out of us. So, how do we handle? How do we deal? How do we relate to needy people in, in a Christ-like way? The amazing thing, and one of the reasons why, there's so many reasons, but one of the reasons why I love the Bible so much is because it's so practical. And, and Jesus gives us a tremendous examples of how to relate to needy people because there were incredibly needy people around Jesus, and, and yet he had boundaries. And, and so I think this message today is going to be incredibly practical for many of us that, that just allow our joy to be stolen in life because of needy people. We want to do the right thing, but many times the motivation is, is not right in helping those. So we want to help, but you can help the wrong way. You can actually help someone in the wrong way that hurts them instead of actually helps them. And, and so the big question, I think, for us is how do we love those who drain the life out of us in a way that honors God? 
And, and so I want to give you three big ideas during our time together in answer to this question, how do we help without hurting? How do we help someone in the right way? How do we help without hurting them? Uh, because a lot of times we're just putting a Band-Aid on it, and, or, or even worse, it, it's actually enabling the needy person, and it's not empowering. And Jesus was all about empowering people. And, and the Holy Spirit, when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to fill us, not to enable, but to empower us. God is all about empowering people. And we all have need. There's no question about it. I have needs. You have needs. And, and so we're talking about those that seem like extraordinary needs, just always needy. How can we really help them without hurting them? Well, like I said, three big ideas today. Here's the first one. We need, how to, we need to learn how to give strategically. We give strategically. In other words, so many times we see someone who's needy and we don't give strategically, or could I put it this way, we don't give prayerfully, we give out of guilt. We, we see a need and, and it breaks our heart and so we want to do something and we don't pray about it, we, we don't have a strategy in our lives, this is how I'm going to help needy people. We just are motivated, not by godliness, but out of guilt instead because it feels good to relieve that guilt that tension in us instead of focusing uh, on what the needy person wants we need to learn how to give strategically and to give what they actually need what actually will will give them relief and, and so what they need oftentimes what a needy person says this is what i need that's actually not what they need at all i, I mean an addict doesn't need another hit of heroin you know, just because we need something doesn't mean that's actually what's going to help us. And so we have to learn how to give strategically what they need that's really going to help. Not emotional giving, but strategic giving that, that really is prayerful and, and is thought through. And there's a plan ahead of time. You know, the example in the Bible, uh, Peter and John, the apostles, uh, you know, disciples of Jesus, and he gave great commission and, and, and sent them out as the apostles. It was the middle of the afternoon one day, and they're on their way to the temple, and they come across a lame man, and he's begging. And look at what the Bible says, Acts chapter 3, verse 3 through 5. Now, this is very interesting. He's a homeless guy. He, he's crippled. He's on the sidewalk. Very common. You may experience this yourself. Look at how these men of God responded to this need of this beggar, and it wasn't in giving him what he, need, what he said he needed. Look at this, it's pretty crazy. When, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, the beggar asked them for money. And Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and then Peter said, look at us. L look at me, look me in the eye. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. You know, uh, many times those that are really, really hurting have learned, if I'm not loud enough, if I don't talk long enough, no one's going to help me. And so they've learned how to express their needs to get what it is that they want. Not necessarily what's best for them, but to get because of putting guilt on other people to get what it is that they really want. What did the lame man want right here? He wanted some cash. He wanted some money. He wanted some, some Benjamins would have been really, really great. Give me some Benjamins because my problem, I, I, I got myself into this problem or all these circumstances and situations swirling around me. I mean, it, it, I was really trying to do the right thing, but here I am, a problem, and, and you're the answer to my problem, so give me some money. And, and it's so powerful to look at Peter and John's response. He was asking for money. Wouldn't that have been really, really easy just to drop a few bills on him? Wouldn't that just be the simple thing? Hey, man, we feel bad for you. Boom, boom, boom. There you go. Have a nice day. Keep on walking. That's not what they did. They honored God because they had a prayer. Remember, they're going to the temple. They had a prayerful mindset. They had a strategy of how they were going to give and what they were going to give. Giving money would have been easy, what he was asking for. 
But can I just say this as best as I know how? Most of the time, people that have perpetual problems don't really know what they need. That's why they have perpetual problems. If they knew what they needed, they wouldn't have gotten in that problem to begin with. Really, really important. I'm dropping some wisdom on y'all right now. He says, show me the money. And watch what Peter says in response. Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 3, verse 6. Then Peter said, silver and gold, I don't have. He goes, I don't have any money for you. I don't have any money for you. But what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the hand, the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He helped him up. You know, so many times today I hear people say, where are all the miracles in the Bible? (laughs) Maybe our money is a shortcut around the miracles of God. Have you ever thought about that? Peter and John just give this beggar the money that he's asking for. No miracle takes place. Money is not the answer that this man needed. He needed God to supernaturally touch his life. And so I love this. It says, he helped him up. Peter helped him up. You know, it's easier to give a handout than a hand up. It's easier to give a handout than a hand up. But Peter gave a hand out. He helped him up. A handout is not always the best thing, even if someone is asking for a handout. Even if someone's asking for a handout, sometimes you're actually hurting that person by giving them what they say they need. They need something greater. And Peter and John recognized this, and they said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And they gave him a hand up instead of a handout. How many opportunities have you and I missed because we did the simple shortcut of a handout instead of giving someone a hand up by faith to lift them up? A handout is not always the best, even if that's what people claim that they need. Say all that to say we must, we've got to be led by the Holy Spirit when it comes to needy people. Because there were needy people in the times of the Bible. And it's crazy how the followers of Jesus responded to needy people in a very different way than most of us as followers of Christ respond to needy people today. Needy people say things like this. If you really loved me, you'd give me more attention. If you really loved me, you'd give me more money. If you really loved me, you'd give me more time. All of that is to appeal to guilt, to make you feel guilty, not to get you to respond godly. And we've got to learn how to see the difference. All of those things, if you really love me, blank, whatever that blank is, that's to appeal to what's not good inside of you, make you feel bad, dirty, you're a no good unless you do something to help me. It's really back to week number one with Pastor Stephen when he talked about dealing with controlling and manipulative people. And Jesus never allowed himself to be controlled and manipulated. The, the disciples, Peter and John here, don't allow themselves to be controlled and to be manipulated, and they're actually responding in a godly way, in a Christ-like way. The answer to, if you really love me, blank, is this. Because I love you, I'm not going to give you what you want. I'm going to give you what you actually need. Because I really love you, I'm not giving you what you're wanting, what you're making me feel guilty about. I'm going to give you what you really need. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I'm going to help you up. I'm going to give you a hand up instead of just a hand out. A hand out is just for a moment. A hand up is for a lifetime. That man who was crippled walked for the rest of his life. So many times I think we're short-sighted and we miss a powerful opportunity that God has given to us. You know, uh, kind of crazy. When I was in, in college, uh, Susie and I, there was this, this, this park in, in Pensacola that uh, we used to love. It has a gazebo. In fact, we were just there a month ago. We went down there, and 
we used to actually, we'd, I'd bring my boom box, and this is back before even Walkman and all, I had my boom box with my, you know, playlist, my, my cassette tape that I recorded from the radio, all these different songs, and it was called The Good Stuff, the, the, the cassette tape. I know most of you haven't even seen a cassette tape, you don't know what I'm talking about, but big boom box, and we'd play music, and we would dance underneath this gazebo, we're just falling in love with each other. And, and one night, I remember, it was like a Friday night, we're down there, at the park, and this guy comes staggering up the sidewalk, and I was so uptight, such an insecure little 21-year-old, you know, 20-year-old, and, uh, and I could tell, he gets closer, just you can smell, just, just awful, and you can smell alcohol all over him, and uh, he, he's kind of staggering, I'm like, oh no, I've got to protect my woman here, you know, this is going to be a bad thing, he's an older gentleman, and uh, and as he walks up, he says, uh, hey, Frank, how you doing? And I'm like, uh, my name's not Frank. And he's like, no, Frank, how you doing? Have you seen Mr. Howard around lately? And I was like, what? He's like, Frank, have you seen Mr. Howard? And all of a sudden, my memory came back. I think it was the Holy Spirit that, that brought it up to memory. And uh, reminded me of a song that we used to sing when I was like in third grade at Gayhead Elementary School in music class. And I start conversing with him, and, and Susie thinks I'm out of my mind. And I'm like, of course I've seen Mr. Howard. You're Mr. Howard. And he's like, oh, how did you know, Frank? I said, really, it's not Mr. Howard. You're Jesse. How are you, Jesse? And he goes, you're right, it's me. <laughs> I'm Jesse. Susie thinks it's completely out of my mind at this point. The song was called The Ballad of Jesse James. Jesse James, the gunfighter, the, the crook, the bandit, his brother was named Frank. And Jesse James, when he kind of tried to go legit, he took the alias of Mr. Howard. So I'm conversing with this guy who's drunk off his rocker and actually making sense with him. And, and Susie thinks I'm absolutely crazy. And then he goes, listen, Frank, he, he goes, uh, do you got some money? I need some money. And I remembered that story of Peter and John, and I was a college student, and quite honestly, I was cold, I was busted, I was bankrupt, I had nothing. I, I mean, there was a time I thought about, you know, giving blood just to make some money. Uh, I mean, it just, I was nothing. And I said, I don't have any money. And then he starts kind of cursing under his breath. I said, but you know what, Jesse? I've got something else. And he goes, what's that? And I said, I want to pray for you. Can I pray for you? And he's like, nah, whatever. I put my hand on his shoulder, and I just prayed for him by the name of Jesse. And, and I'll never forget it. After I was done praying, Susie's standing there praying with him, and I took my hand off, and he went like this. And he was completely sober. Completely sober. Couldn't even walk in a straight line before. And he looked at me, and he swore a few times, and he walked off into the darkness. And I just knew at that moment God was leading me to do that. Because sometimes it's easier to give a hand up than a hand up. And a week later, at church, our, our church there, Liberty Church, they always would go downtown, and people that were homeless and all, they would in a van, and they'd bring them to church. A week later, I saw Jesse sitting on the front row and at the end of the service he received Christ as his Lord and his Savior and I ran down and I was like Jesse Jesse and he said actually that's not my real name he told me his real name and all this and he says to me thank you so much for praying for me that night I don't know what happened but I've been different since she prayed for me how about that it's easier to give a handout than it is a hand up my friend, I don't remember what his name is, Jesse didn't need money. What he needed was Jesus. He needed Jesus. And so it's so important when, when someone says, you know, I don't have $300 to make my car payment, mom and dad, and you realize, well, how did you buy that Apple Watch you just got yesterday? You know, it, it's a lot easier to give a handout than a hand up. When someone wants us to validate them, uh, really you need to love and accept yourself for who you are. Someone wants more of our time, uh, you know, and just kind of keeps just 
drawing life right out of us, just sucking the life right out of us. Uh, you, you need to develop your own relationships with other people, not just draining my life. It's not just uh, giving people what they want. We need the wisdom to do what's right. We need the wisdom to give them what they really, really need, not what they want. It's not just going to, to tell you what's on my heart, but it, it, it's I love you and I'm going to tell you what you need to hear not just what you want to hear. We need to give strategically. And the second thing is this, we need to serve wisely. We need to give strategically. We need to serve wisely. What would Jesus do? You don't hear that question a lot. What would Jesus do? WWJD. You know what Jesus would do in any circumstance or situation? He would serve selflessly. He would love authentically. He would give generously. He would teach faithfully. And he would listen compassionately. And, And At the same time, there were so many people that had so great needs in Jesus' time. You know what else Jesus would do? He would also stop, turn away from all the needs of the people, and he would go off to be by himself, to recharge with God. In order to keep giving out, you've got to stop to fill up. That's what Jesus would do. Look at it, a great uh, uh, account of this in Mark chapter 1, verse 35. The Bible says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, and he left the house, and he went off to a solitary place where he could pray. And Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they explained, Everyone was looking for you, and you know what the inference there is this. Everyone's looking for you. There's so much need. There's so much we need you to do. We need you to do this and this and this and this. And And Jesus is like, I was where I was supposed to be by myself, getting recharged. Over and over we see this in Jesus' life, that it's not about meet every need that you see. I've got to fill up before I can pour out. And there are times when the crowd's pressing in on him, and he's like, guys, get me a boat. He jumps in the boat to go to the other side to withdraw from all the needs. And so we need to serve, but we need to serve wisely. We need to be real, real wise. It's like, you know, on an airplane, uh, when you go through the whole thing about the mask, and what do they say? If you're traveling with small children, please secure your mask first, and then choose which one of your children you want to live, and which one you want to die. No, they don't say that, but uh, which one's your favorite? You put the mask on them first, and then the not-so-favorite. No, it's just, just a joke, and I know we're dedicating children today, and I thought maybe that would be funny, but obviously it's not very funny, so I'm going to just move right on. So, uh, anyway, it's always secure. You've got, to, you've got to look out for yourself first or you're not going to be good for anybody. You can't help anyone else. And, you know, it's so interesting, that parable that, that we, we know, uh, maybe you're, you know it, uh, the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, actually, before I get to that one, let me talk about this one, the Good Samaritan. There's the story of a good Samaritan that there was a Jewish guy who was all beaten up and left for dead in a ditch. And a uh, number of people went by, didn't do anything. But a Samaritan who really was like, they were enemies at that point uh, of the Jewish people. A Samaritan comes by and he sees this Jewish man. And instead of walking past him, he kneels down. He helps him up out of the ditch. He bandages his wounds. He takes him to a hotel or a place to stay. He gives the owner of the building some money. And he says, I'm going to be back here. And then he leaves him for a few days. And, and he disappears. Here's a big question. What was he doing? Where'd he go? You know what he was doing? He withdrew from the need. He probably went back home. He probably got a good night's sleep, some food himself, went to work, and then he came back to check on the one that had the needs that he had helped. He didn't stay in the same place with the guy. You see this even with the Good Samaritan. He helped him, and then he withdrew from him. And there's so many hangers on that that just want to be there all the time, and we've got to learn how to be wise. You and I have to learn how to be wise. There's so many, I think this is one of the leading causes of pastoral burnout is because there's always a need. There was always a need with Jesus. And so many pastors don't know how to withdraw from all the need because if you are not healthy yourself, and could I put it this way, you're 
marriage is not healthy and your kids are not healthy, you can't help anybody else. You can't help anybody else. And so we need to learn how to serve wisely. You, you can't say yes often if you don't say no occasionally. Boy, I love that. You can't say yes often if you can't say no, if you don't say no occasionally. When, when I was just a little boy down in Georgia growing up, my dad told, tells this story of what happened. I was so young, I couldn't even remember this, but it had to do with my oldest brother. He's six years older than me. Uh, and, and it changed the trajectory of my family. And the reality is, I believe, and my dad has said the same thing, this story I'm about to share with you, if, this, if he had not made the right decision in this story, my dad, I don't think this church would be here today. My father was serving at the time in, in the 60s, late 60s. He, he was serving, giving a couple nights a week. He would go out and he would be on a, a drug hotline. And that was a, a number, a telephone number that people could call in Brunswick, Georgia, there in the surrounding area. If they were needing help, addiction, anything like that, my dad was one of the ones that answered the phone. He would give hours and hours, a couple nights a week to this. And he told the story. He came home from work, had dinner, and, and he was, went back, back into the bathroom, and he was shaving off the 5 o'clock shadow. And my, little bro, my older brother, he was little at the time, he was like three or four years old, five, and he walks in and he asks my father, this is before I'm even born, he asks my dad, he's like, Daddy, what are you doing? And my dad, as best as he could, explaining to his little son, my brother Russ, uh, I, I'm going, I'm going to help these people, I'm going to answer the phone for those that are really having difficult times in their life, and, and I'm going to be there, and I'm going to be able to pray with them, I'm going to be able to help them. And, and he was describing as he could in a way that a young boy could understand this drug hotline that, that uh, he was serving at. And my little brother, he was little at the time, I'm sorry, I keep getting confused. My older brother, he was little at the time, he turns to my father and he says, Daddy, that's great. I hope there's someone just like you that's there for me when I grow up and have that problem. My dad went down to the hotline that night and resigned. Because he made the decision, I refuse to neglect my children that I'm responsible for to help someone else's child that I don't have the same responsibility for. And it changed the trajectory of the Williamson family tree that night. Because my dad decided, I'm going to put my family ahead of anyone else's family. That's my first priority. See, we've got to learn how to serve wisely. G Jesus even said, you're always going to have the need, you're always going to have the poor with you. We've got to learn how to serve wisely. We've got to learn how to give strategically. We've got to learn how to serve wisely. And here's the last thing. We've got to learn how to trust completely. We've got to learn how to trust God completely. Completely. Because the reality is this. When, when you and I get this Savior mentality that we are going to be able to basically be Jesus for someone else, you know, some kind of megalomaniac or, or, or some ego trip, uh, it, it's insulting to God. When we actually believe that I can save anyone, that's, that's, that's like poking God in the eye. It's insulting and dangerous to think that, that you and I are the answer for someone else. We're not. Jesus is the answer. We're just the servants. Jesus is the one who has the power. We're just the conduit. And, and I mean, I've heard people say that to me before. They come to me like, listen, I've I got to sit down with you and talk about my marriage. You've got to save my marriage. Whoa, hold on. I never died for anybody. I never laid my life down and, and, and was, was nailed to a cross for anyone. There's only one Savior, and that's Jesus Christ. And, and anyone that would ever allow someone to think that they saved them, you know, uh, there, there's theologically real big problems with that, and, and there's an ego problem behind that. 
There's only one Savior. Now let me just ask you, to prove my point. How many of you, just raise your hand right now, how many of you, in the hearing my voice right now, have been crucified and nailed on a cross before and died for someone else? None of you. None of us. It's completely illegitimate to allow someone to have that mindset, oh, he's just the sa- he saved me. He saved my marriage. That counselor saved my marriage. Whoa. Hold up. We've got to trust God. God's the only one that can save. God is the only one that heals. God is the only one that restores. At best, all we are is a conduit. We're just a channel. Look at what Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8 says. It says, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. And so many times when we find people that are they're having perpetual problems in their life, really, really needy, and it just never seems to go away. We need to remember God's word here because here's the thing. A man reaps what he sows. This is a principle you can deny. None of us can outrun this. None of us can change this. God says whatever we sow, we're going to reap. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from their flesh, they'll reap destruction. A lot of the problems that you and I encounter in our life, it's not because our moms and our dads, it's not because of the boss overlooked us, it's our own making. We're reaping things that we've sown. And and that's why we've got to point people to trust in God more. Because it, it, a lot of the stuff, the difficulties we go through, it, it's not God judging us. It, it's not God punishing us. It's wheels that we started rolling in our own lives. And now we want to be free from those things. But God says what you reap, you're going to sow. And you sow from, from uh, pleasing the flesh, you're going to reap destruction. But here's the good news. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, to please God, why? He's the Savior. He's the Savior, not Greg Williamson, not the pastor, not your group leader, not not anyone else. There's only one Savior. There's only one name under heaven and earth by which man must be saved. It is not Greg Williamson. It is no pastor. It's no evangelist. It's Jesus and Jesus only. We are hurting people by trying to be saviors to them. We need to point them to the only one who did die for them. And that was not Greg Williamson. That was Jesus Christ. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. From the Spirit will reap eternal life. Started talking about the prodigal son there, but but instead it was the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. The prodigal son, very interesting parable as well. It, it's, it talks about the the second son who came to his father and goes, listen, let me just paraphrase, like, dad, I'm not going to wait around until you die. I want my inheritance now. And it broke the father's heart. And so the father said, okay. And so he gave him his share of his inheritance. And uh, as Jesus told the story, and it's talking about really God the father, how we break his heart, the prodigal son went and he wasted all the money, squandered it, and uh, ends up taking a job feeding pigs which is like the lowest of the low for a Jewish man. And then the Bible says, so interesting, as as Jesus tells this story, that the young man came to his senses. He came to his senses. And, and, And he realized that the servants in his father's house actually eat better than he was. The pigs were eating better than he was. And, uh, He says, I will turn and I will go back to my father. And it says, while he was a long way off, the father saw him. Now what's so interesting is this, the son had incredible needs, but the father never sent out a search party for him. The father looked, was waiting, was praying, and waited till he saw his son coming back to him. And when his son came to his senses and came back to him, that's when the father went out and ran to the son. Big, big difference. The father was trusting God with his boy, who he knew in all likelihood was in a bad spot. The father loved his son. He waited and he prayed, but the father never rescued his son. He waited until the son came to his senses. 
moms, dads, fellow pastors, rescuing isn't always helping. In fact, sometimes rescuing actually hurts people more than it helps them. If mom, dad, if, if your, your kid is always running late, maybe they need to lose their job to learn the lesson. If, if they're partying out their brains, uh, partying their brains out and don't go to class in college, maybe they need to lose their scholarship to learn the lesson. Charging up debt, vacations, and, and, and new outfits and all those things, and then can't make their car payment, or I got to have rent, mom and dad, or I'm going to be evicted. Maybe they need to get evicted. I, I, I've been a pastor a long time, and I'm a parent. I've never seen parental rescue helping kids. I've, I've always seen it come back and haunt parents. Always. Always. Because whatever someone sows, that is going to reap. And, and we, can't, we can't beat that mom and dad, no matter how hard it is to watch our kids. We can't beat that. Can't beat it. I love what David said in Psalm 70, verse 5. I think it's so important. He says, but as for me, I'm poor and needy. Look at what David, man after his own, God's own heart, I'm poor and needy. So look at what he says. Come quickly to me, Greg. No, he doesn't say Greg. Come quickly to me, pastor. No. Come quickly to me, boss. No. God. Come quickly to me. God. I need God. I need God. You are my help, my deliverer. Not Greg. Not Dr. Greg. Lord, do not delay. Do not delay. At best, all I can do and anyone else can ever do for someone in need is point them to Jesus who can provide everything that they really, really need, not what they want. We're pointers. And that's why it's so important that we gather together like this, you know, in Poughkeepsie and, and, and here in Hopewell and even online. Because because. There's something about sometimes we need to point other people to Jesus. Sometimes we need others to point us. That's why we need to get together. That's why it's so important to point to Jesus. Let me end with this, and, and especially for like helicopter parents, moms and dads. But, but maybe even for those of you that, man, you're just giving out, giving out, giving out, giving out, and you're going to burn out if you haven't already because the needs are always going to be there. I think it's so important that we realize this truth. You can't fix a fix that God has fixed to fix someone. You, you can't fix a fix that God has fixed to fix someone. There are consequences to decisions. And we're supposed to help in a way that points people to Jesus, not just forgives them a moment of relief back at the same thing tomorrow. You can't fix a fix that God has fixed to fix someone. That there are chain reactions and ripple effects that we've set into our own lives. And all that is not God punishing us. It's not God judging us. It's not God condemning us. It's God saying, like that father to the prodigal, come on back to me. Come on back to me. Listen, I, I know for some, you may be tuning in online today because everything's just falling apart around you. And you're like, I'm just going to give this a shot. Give God a shot. Or you're in our Poughkeepsie campus, and the reason you're there is I'm going to give Jesus a shot. Make him the center. He's saying, come on back to me. Come back. And when he sees us come to our senses, he comes out to meet us. And he runs to us. Just like in the story that Jesus told of the prodigal. So much time, so much energy, so many resources wasted trying to fix a fix that God has fixed to bring someone to their senses, to bring them back to Him. I don't want to stand in God's way. I want to give strategically to those that are in need I want to serve wisely those that are in need. And I want to trust God completely and point those needy people, 
each and every one. And I'm needy too. Point to Jesus. I don't know about you, but I need him more today than I've ever needed him before. So I'm going to ask, would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you that when everything around us seems hopeless, that you can bring us hope in the middle of any circumstance or situation. God, I just pray for each and every one of us, Lord. There, there's needy people in our lives. Lord, help us by your Holy Spirit that we be committed, Lord, to give strategically, to serve wisely, but ultimately to trust you completely, God, because you're moving and you're doing more for the good of those around us than we can possibly comprehend. You're more active than we realize. You're more involved than we realize, and you care more, and you love more than we could ever know. And so, Father, we trust you completely. And Lord, help us to be like Jesus who withdrew from the needs to fill himself up before he could give out. Thank you, Lord. And right now, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I just want to give an opportunity to anyone, everyone, in the sound of my voice today, if you've never come back to God and received Jesus Christ as your Savior, He's the Savior. He lived for you a sinless life. He died for you a sacrificial death, and He rose from you a powerful resurrection from the dead. The Bible says if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so right now in this moment, if you've never done it before, I'd like to lead you in a prayer that you can repeat after me, even in a whisper. This is between you and God. And receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord today. Just pray after me right now. Say, Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. I turn from them today and I come back to you. Jesus, thank you for living for me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for rising from the dead for me. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Jesus, I ask you to lead me, guide me, direct me by your Holy Spirit from this day forward. And I will follow you. Amen.